We've been in this series framework, and it's this idea of things that are happening behind the scenes. Now, back in the day, and some still do this, but they have the dark rooms. And if you see, we created a dark room in here. It got real dark. I'm like, I can't see anybody. So I can't see the whites of your eyes. So you're going to have to talk back to me so I know you're still there, okay? Don't walk out on me. But it's this whole idea of it's what's unseen that determines what's seen. And when they have the dark room, they take these photographs, and the picture paper is very, very sensitive to light. And so you have to take it into a dark room. They have special lighting that can be lit, and so that underneath it, when the light shines through the photo, it creates an image or a picture. And I think this is so true for us is the more we are around the true light and we get in his presence, that he illuminates every part of us and what needs to become a clear picture of our lives, our calling, our purpose only happens when his light shines through us. But it's in the unseen. A lot of us want the, the seen touch of God but can I tell you that most of what you will receive from the Lord will happen in the unseen chambers of your quiet time with the Lord. Can I tell you that church is really good and I love his presence in this space. I was crying all through worship. I don't know. I, I just, I, when I feel his presence, I'm just, I cry. When he comes into the room, I cry. When I feel him, I cry. I love church. But can I tell you that my most precious moments with Jesus are at five o'clock in the morning when I'm by myself. I love you, but give me Jesus. Give me a quiet space with my Jesus. That's the most impactful time. And so I want to talk about your unseen world. Last week, we talked about lenses. So we're, we're looking at the, all this uh, photography and video stuff. That's what I'm kind of correlating it to. A lot of you know we have a creative firm, and so we're around cameras and lenses all the time. But today, I, we were talking about last week, and if you didn't uh, catch the message, make sure you go back. And look at it. It's, it was talking about seeing the big picture, what lenses we need to, to do that. But this week, I want to talk about frames. I want to talk about frames. Uh, the way you frame things in your life is very important. And the way you frame things actually either supports or maybe even intentionally um, discourages your movement and your next step. And I believe there are a lot of people in this room today. You might be in a space where the Lord is speaking over you. And you might have things in your past that you are trying to make sense of so that you can walk forward into your tomorrow. How many's yesterday doesn't always make sense? I got some things in my yesterday that I'm like, what the jazz is that? Why did I go through that? So I want to talk about your framing because the way you frame your past can affect the way you reframe your future. But you got to put a frame on it. I think of, of pictures when we, when we used to print them off. Does anybody else print pictures still? <laughs> I went to the one-hour print photo thing for the baptism pictures, and they came out. I was like, this is so nostalgic. I'm like, can I just stay here with you? Can you just print some more photos for me so I can feel them and touch them? Like, we're such a digital age. I just, I miss the, di the, the printing, you know? I remember back in the day when they had the disposable cameras. Y'all remember those? They did to click them. And then you take the next picture. And you have no idea how that picture looks until you take it to the one-hour photo place. And some of them have your thumb over the, the lens. You know, you're like, ah, oh, that was such a good moment, but totally missed it. But the, the way that when we print photos, we put them in frames. And frames is what surrounds what's in, in the picture. And some are fancy frames. Some are just normal frames. Some could get really expensive. And some could be cheapies. But it matters how you frame things because when you look back, it's amazing what happens when we look back at our past. It can either give us faith for the future or it can give us fear of failure. If you frame something wrong, you can actually create more fear for your future. If you frame the way you've 
grown up or what you've accomplished or what who God was in your life growing up, who your parents were, all, all these things. If you frame it wrong, it can actually create fear. And so it's important that you frame your past correctly. I want to talk today about how we do that because it's easier said than done. But how are you framing what you're, you're living in right now? Uh, I want to talk today about that there's two ways that you can approach life. And first off, we have to talk about the past because your past is always there. It's not, that's not going to change. You can't go back and, and you can't do the back of the future. You know, the car that drives real fast and you go into the future. I wish you could. That'd be really sick. I remember when I watched that movie, I was like, could we, you know, will there ever be a day that we can like go back? No, it's, it's not going to happen. What, what has happened is concrete. It's, it's, it's in your past. It's in your story. And for some of you, you're like, I wish I could erase that. But I want to tell you that there's a God who can redeem it. And, and it depends on how you frame it. Because the Lord takes us through some things and some things are harder than others. And some have way more tragic stories than others. I sit with many of you and I hear your stories and, and I'm like, the Lord has kept you and protected you through some really crazy things. And I, I, I hear the statistics about kids and sexual abuse. And I, I hear about those that have been raised in uh, abusive families. And, and my mind is like, you know what? Life's not fair. It's not fair. It's not fair to look around at our neighbors and, and judge their story compared to ours because it's just life. Life is flawed and we all have different stories. But I believe that the Lord can frame your past and he can help us frame our past in a way that he can redeem it so that we step forward transformed. And this is the renewing process. It takes time. This isn't something that I'm going to preach this message and all of a sudden you're going to reframe everything and go forward perfect. I'm not saying that because God is a God of the process. He's a God. And I've been through some processes. Now, some of you in this room, you've been through some processes. You've been through some things where God has tried to explain and, and help you understand but still, you're still in the middle of it with many questions saying, God, why? Why did that happen? One thing I want to look at today is, is Psalms chapter 46. It's like, it gives a great reference to who God is in our story. And no matter where we go, no matter what we've been through or what's happened to us or what scars we've brought into this room today, I believe that we serve the same God. We do. We serve the same God. He is the same for you and he's the same for me. And we looked at how he is the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. And so I know that he is the beginning of my story and he's the end of my story. Or he is the end of my story. And I believe that for you as well. And so I, Psalm 46, chapter one says this, God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. And we can stop there, but we're going to read nine more verses. But you can stop there. God is our refuge and strength. Let's talk about those two things really quick. A refuge is a place you go to for safety. It's not a place that takes away the danger but it's a place that can protect in the middle of danger. So when God is our refuge, he's a place that no matter what has happened in your story, he can be the protection in the middle of the danger, in the middle of the tragedy, in the middle of the crisis. And this is why it's so important that we be church family. Because I need you when, when, when crap hits the fan. When things go down in my life and things are murky and stormy and I'm looking around saying, I don't know if this boat's going to float. I need you to be in the middle of it because God is my refuge and I'm in a safe place, but I need people to sit with me in the middle of it. I think it helps to have community in the middle of reframing your past because it's people that can sit with you and say, me too. You know, the most powerful words you can tell somebody is me too. Me too. Sometimes I don't feel qualified. Me too. Sometimes I don't feel like I'm enough for my kids. Me too. Sometimes I feel like my past doesn't make sense. Me too. 
Sometimes things have happened to me that I feel flawed and marked. Me too. And it's okay because God is our refuge. He's the safe place where we can come and get out of the danger. He's the safe place we can come and find peace. Now that's good for all of us. And we can stop there, but he keeps going. He says he's our refuge and our strength. Now the Bible says this, is that he is our strength when we are weak. It doesn't say he's our strength when we're strong. He says he's our strength when we're weak. And when we're at our weakest, he's at his best. Now that's really good news because no matter how down and out you've gotten or where your past has taken you or where life has, has connected you to, hey, guess what? God's your strength in the middle of it. And God's your strength right now. And so whatever you've been through, God's your strength. He's your refuge. He protects you. And he's given you strength in the middle of it. And then he says this, he's an ever-present help in trouble. All right, we can stop there, but we're not. Let's read the rest of the verses, all right? God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Now let's read the rest of this through a filter, through your story. Some of you are looking back at your past right now, even as we talk today. You're like, ah, oh, I don't want to bring this up. The, the things I don't want to face. And I, I understand. I understand there are things that I don't want to look at. I don't want to put a frame around it. I don't want to have a picture on my, my desk with that part of my story. I understand that. But if we can read it through the context of who God is in our life and in our story, my friend, you will see that God's been present in your story the whole time. You'll see that his hand was on you and protecting you and brought you to this space right now. And no matter where you've been, I believe that God has been there with you. So read this. Let's read this together. Psalm 46, verse 2. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fail. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done. The desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted on the earth. What a filter to look to life with, right? That our God, we don't need to fear because he's our refuge and strength, our present help in time of troubles. And guess what? He is, the, he is the God who makes the streams. He makes the streams of life in the middle of the chaos. That's why I'm obsessed with this scripture is because it's beauty in the middle of ashes. It's beauty in the middle of disgust. It's, it's wars breaking out, the world going crazy, and yet our God is still a God who gives streams of life in the middle of it. This is the filter through which we can look at our stories as though we might have come through a mess, but my God can redeem it because he's a good God who's still flowing streams of life into my story. And though I've been somewhere, God can use it. I want to encourage someone in the room, where you've been, God's going to use it. Where you've been, you can frame that thing up to God's going to use it. God's going to use that story. God's going to use that pain. He's going to use that abuse. He's going to use that neglect. You're like, how in the world can he use that? Let me tell you, when he heals you, when he redeems you, when he brings you to the, the place where he is with you and he's your dwelling space, he becomes your refuge and your strength and your help in any time of trouble. That's good news because that's the place of healing is when we dwell with him. Oh, Jesus, you're so good. And when you're with him, he puts all the pieces back together. It's like a big old puzzle. 
He's like, whoa, that one went far off, but let's put that back in here. Let's put my son back together. Let's put my daughter back together. But it's when we trust him and I believe that God can redeem your story. So however you came in today, you can frame your past as God's going to use it. You practice with me? Come on, frame your past right now and just say, God's going to use that. Tell your neighbor like you mean it. Say, God's going to use that. Woo! Now tell him God's going to use your story. That's right. Verse 10, he says this. This is a game changer. He says, be still. Be still. Becoming still. Woo! So hard. But there is perspective in the still that you cannot see in the step. There's perspective in the still that you will not be able to see as you are marching and stepping, as you're grinding and doing life. He says, all of this goodness that I am for you, my children, you know how you see it? You be still. And in order to frame correctly, we got to learn the posture of stillness. And I want to ask you today, how can you become still before the Lord? Still enough to hear who he is in your story. Still enough to look back and see how he's been a part of the chapters. And he was with you, holding you through the pain. I remember when I was going through something, one of the hardest things in my life, someone told me to learn how to be cradled by the Lord. I was like, at first it didn't make sense. And at first I thought it was, um, have you ever had those things that just feel disrespectful when you're going through the middle of pain? It's like you're grieving the loss of somebody and says, and someone's like, you know, oh, I know how you feel. It's like, bro, don't. Don't. I don't want to hear that. It's disrespectful. Like, just leave me alone. And I know it's not. People mean well. But you know, one of those things, and, and he was like, you just need to learn how to be cradled by the Lord. I'm like, bro, what a cop out. <laughs> I don't want to be cradled by the Lord. But as I started praying over it, I started realizing many scriptures are pointing to the Lord as a refuge or a safe haven or a place that we can go. And if you think about being in danger, you run to safety. And in that safe place, you can think clearly. Think about when it, when it rains and it's down, and we're, we're praying for those who are in the middle of all the hurricanes right now, who have lost homes and now have to rebuild. We're praying over them. But as the storm comes in, all you're thinking is, get to a safe place so I can be safe. And you can't think clearly when you're running. All you're thinking about is get safety, get to safety. And God's like, hey, I am the space. You can find refuge and you can be safe and take a breath and be still and know he is God. That was craziness that I just went through. I've been running, trying to get away from it. But man, when I sit with him, I realize, oh, he's my safe place. I can be still and know he is God. He is working. He is moving on my behalf. God is so good. But it's, it, there's perspective in the still. So how do you become still? I, I love the story in Exodus where Moses had led the people out of slavery and they find themselves uh, up against the water, the big Red Sea, and the Egyptians now are breathing down their neck, right? They're coming to kill them because they want... They want to bring them back into slavery. And the Israelites are standing there in fear in between death and drowning. There's no, there's death and death. Nothing, nothing anywhere else. And I thought about this, this. Do you ever feel like that? Where you're in the middle of maybe your life and you've tried to frame your past, looking through the future, and you, you feel like it's like death and death. Like, I don't know where I'm going. I'm spinning. 
And I love in Exodus because uh, Moses gives them a command that is beautiful, but it speaks to how we see God. He says this, fear not, stand still, and see. Three things. Number one, don't fear. Number two, be still. Number three, see. That's powerful. When we learn to say no to fear, how many know that's very hard? Because you know you're rocking through your life and all of a sudden a thought comes in or something comes into your, your life where it causes fear and anxiety to rise up in you. You know, I, I, I have it happen where I'm just going through my week and all of a sudden I'm like, where's this coming from? But I, I feel fear. Fear for my kids or fear for my wife or fear for our, 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 our work or fear for the church or, or whatever. And it's like these random thoughts. And in those moments, we have to say no to fear. No fear, no. And it's not a fear like, I'm just not gonna think about it. I'm gonna hold my hands over my ears and go, la, 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 I'm not listening. It's not happening. No, the world's not a bad place. I'm not gonna fear. No, 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 I'm not gonna listen to, no, no, I'm not saying that. It's a fear based on faith and fact. It's a fear, it's, it's a, a fearlessness based on a faith that's set on fact, knowing that our God is in control of our story. He's in control of the outcome. He is the beginning and the end. So he's already got the last chapter written for me. And so I'm choosing not to fear. When I look at my bank account, I'm like, oh Lord, how am I gonna do it? I don't fear. Because I say, okay, God, you've shown up before. I know you're faithful. I know you're a good God. So my faith is built on fact that God is for me, not against me. And whatever weapon is formed against me, it, it will not prosper. I know that. And so I choose not to fear. And I'm gonna curse somebody this week to not fear, to say, no, I'm not going to fear. That when you look at your past and you're looking into your future, that we say, no, I'm not going to fear. Because we have to learn the art of this. I want to learn the art of framing first. Somebody say framing first. When we think about framing, we think of framing after the fact. We take the picture, you know, we get it developed, and then we put it in the frame and we frame whatever's happened. But the Lord gives us the ability to frame first, meaning we can choose what we're walking into instead of just having it happen, happenstance. We can choose to accept the will of the Lord over our lives and step into it boldly and confidently. Now, I'm not saying the arrogance of saying, okay, you're just going to imagine all this stuff and just walk into it. It's just all going to appear. I'm not saying, oh, if you want to be rich, you're just going to speak wealth over yourself and just walk into it and be a wealthy person. I'm not saying that, okay, you're just going to be a healed person. So you're just going to declare I am healed and just walk into it. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is there's a will of God over your life. It's a perfect will over your life. And you can only get it from being in relationship with Jesus and walking in step with him. And the faster you can get that, the faster you can be with him, the faster he can speak over you, you can, you can step into that confidently and you frame first. Now, what, what Moses was telling them was this. There's death and death on either side of you. Now, you can choose your outcome. You can either stand here in fear and, and just be on your own strength and probably die because the Egyptians are coming for you. And there's something in your life that it might be coming for you. You're like, I, I don't understand, but someone's out for me or life just seems to, to have my number and calling me every day. And so you're facing things and you're like, I'm in between death and death. And Moses said this, he said, no, we're gonna frame first. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna choose not to fear, number one. We're gonna keep ourselves in a good place mentally. We're gonna say, no, I'm not gonna choose anxiety right now. I'm gonna choose to know that God is on the throne. He says, so no, no fear. And then I'm gonna stand still. I'm gonna still myself enough to hear that the Lord is with me. I'm going to still myself enough to know that the Lord is present in my moment. That's powerful. And he says, then we're going to see the hand of God work. When you frame first, you start to look ahead at your life coming. And you say, you know what? What do I want to step into? What is the Lord declaring over my year? When we pray over our year, we pray over a word. And we're like, Lord, give us a word so we know how to prepare. And when the Lord spoke torrential over this year, 
we said, well, how do you prepare for that? Get the storm windows out, you know? Do you know there's storm windows? Yeah. People in Florida know about storm windows. They have hurricane-proof windows. Crazy. And I've seen the effect of someone who doesn't have storm windows and someone who does. And so we, we know when the Lord speaks a word, we have to prepare our house. There's things we need to do. We need to do to our hearts. We need to do to prepare and plan because when the Lord speaks it, it's going to happen. It's too dark and I can't see you. When the Lord speaks it, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. So we have to prepare our hearts. So framing first is saying, all right, Lord, let me be still and hear what you're speaking. What are you speaking over me? What are you speaking over my past? How can I frame my past in order to now frame first what I'm walking into? That I already set the frame of where I'm headed. They already set the frame of what I want my marriage to look like. I already set the frame of what my home feels like. I already set my frame of how I'm going to parent. I already set my frame of how I'm going to go into this relationship as I start dating and I start trying to meet people. I, I already set the frame. I'm going to step into what God wants for my life. But it starts in being still. Being still and hearing him and letting him speak over you. That goes back to that time where, where, where someone said, get cradled by the Lord. And I remember coming before the Lord and saying, Lord, okay, my, my only goal in this meeting with you is I just want to be cradled by you. And I remember, oh man, I was, I was sobbing like a baby as I felt the presence of the Lord surround me. And I realized that's what it feels like to have refuge. It's not that the pain goes away. It's that you have a safe place to process the pain. It's not that magically one day you stop feeling that grief. It's that now you have a healthy space to process what happened. And now you're healing in a healthy way because the Lord's breathing on your health. Now the Lord's breathing on your grief. Now he's breathing on that which hurts. But when we're still, we can hear him. When we're still, we can know and get that frame. And then we step into it and say, all right, Lord, now I'm going to frame first. Come on, somebody say frame first. I'm going to challenge you this week to frame first, to start looking at your life and start journaling and saying, what do I want to step into? And more importantly, not what do I want? What does the Lord want me to step into? That's more importantly, because you can fight the Lord and then be miserable your entire life. And you can want things, but man, if you step out of God's will, forget about it. Like, I, I don't want any part of it. I know that I, we, we've been on a journey with God. And sometimes it's like, the Lord leads us into places and we're like, are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure? And then we'll get like a confidence boost and be like, all right, we're both confirmed in it. So we'll step into it. But what I've realized is that the Lord never leaves me. He's always one step ahead of me. And he's always thinking thoughts that are higher than mine. I always know that. Because there are times where I start to doubt and I know he has my best interest in mind. I know he does, but I start to doubt. And so I have to trust in him. I have to be still and know that he's God. So I want to give you three things really quickly as I close. Three things in a scripture, all right? And we're going to land this plane because I believe that God wants to frame your story because he's going to use it. I serve a God who, who frames our story and uses it to impact lives. So I want to give you three things. How do we reframe? Are you ready? Number one, look for God's goodness. Look for God's goodness. If you're reframing something of the past, look for God's goodness in it. If you're, if you're framing the future, Look for God's goodness all around you. I understand you might be in a, a crazy season. You might be in something that doesn't make sense right now. But I promise you, my friend, you could find the goodness of God in it. I promise you, he's there. It's like us taking uh, inventory and taking inventory of the blessings of God. There's this old song, count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. 
Count your blessings. Name them one by one. Count your many blessings. See what God has done. <laughs> Yay! That's one of those oldies grew up in church singing. But it's powerful when we start counting the blessings of God in our life. We start looking at the goodness of God in our life. And we change our hearts to be grateful for what God is doing. What God has done and what he's going to do. You can be grateful for what God's going to do even. Saying, God, I'm praying over my kids. I'm praying over my home. I'm praying over my future. And I thank you in advance for answering the prayers. I thank you in advance for what you're going to speak over and, and do in my life. So number one, look for the goodness of God. That's how you can frame first. Say, Lord, I thank you in advance for what I'm stepping into. It might not all be roses. It might not all be perfect. And it might not all be easy. It might be hard. I know sometimes walking in the will of God is hard. But you know, walking outside the will of God is way harder. So walking with God is, man, it's, it's a walk in the park compared to walking outside of his will. So look for the goodness of God. Number two, speak words of faith. Somebody say faith. faith. You better say faith like you mean it because you're going to need it. Faith. Good. Faith. Speak words of faith. Here's what I found about faith. When you speak words of faith, it does something to your spirit. When you feel fear, that is the time you need to speak words of faith. Faith, confidently. It's, it might not start confidently, but you need to find some scriptures, and I call them daggers, because you know the long swords that are like four chapters long, that scripture? It's like taking you three hours to read it. I'm not talking about the big swords. I'm talking about little daggers that you can pull out, short scriptures that you can pull out and speak confidently over what's happening in the moment. You need to learn words of faith. And if you need some, text me, call me. Let's talk about it. I got a sword for war, a whole book of scriptures that you can use. Just quick ones to say, Lord, I, it looks like it's crazy right now, but I confidently speak your word over this situation. There's been many times where we've been in, in situations that didn't make sense and seemed like it was out of our control. And in that moment, we just reminded each other, hey, no, the Lord called us here. He's doing a perfect thing. And remember, he gave us the keys to the kingdom. What? What he opens, no man can shut. Get that in your, in your belly and start saying it. Man, Lord, you called me here and you gave me the keys of the kingdom. So what you open, no man can shut. Can you imagine the confidence you're going to build yourself as you walk through your life and your calling? What you open, no man can shut. And what you shut, no man can open. Woo, those are words of faith. I'm not dependent on you. My God opens and shuts the doors. <laughs> Takes control out of everybody around me. You can't control my future. My God opens doors you can't shut. And he shuts doors you can't open. Woo, that's the God I'm following. So speak words of faith. You want to frame your future? You want to frame it in a way that you're stepping in confidently, the calling of God in your life? Start speaking faith over your future. Stop saying, I'm not enough. Stop saying words that are, are fear-filled. Well, I'm not sure, and what if, and all these things that we, we love to process and repeat over our minds. Hey, guess what? There's always gonna be a what if. Always. But what if God shows up, right? Like, what if something goes bad? Yes, I understand that. There's always that. But what if God shows up and a miracle happens? What if God shows up and blows your mind? What if God shows up and his works are bigger than what you thought was going to happen? Your job was better than what you were praying for. That spouse was more than what you were thinking about. It happens with the Lord. So number one, look for his goodness. Number two, speak words of faith. And number three, this is a renewing. Speak life over yourself. Speak life over yourself. Psalm 119. And I close with this. Sean, you can come. Psalm 119 says this in verse 18. Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. I am a stranger on earth. Do not hide your commands from me. My soul is consumed 
with longing for your laws at all times. The psalmist starts with this, open my eyes. Open my eyes. I believe that when we start to, to get in the stillness of God, when we start to be still with him and find those spaces to meet with him, whether it's early morning or nighttime, you find that afternoon lunch period of your work to just get along with him and be still. Our prayer needs to be this, Lord, open my eyes to see who I am. Open my eyes to see what you created me as so that I can speak the correct words over myself. Because the Holy Spirit wants to partner with you to rebuild your mind, your spirit. Holy Spirit wants to remind you. In fact, his whole job is to strengthen and counsel you, to lead you. Jesus went to be with, with God. He's up in heaven right now at his right. He's interceding over you, but he didn't leave us alone. We have Holy Spirit He's here on earth with us. He's striking a fire in us. He's counseling us. He's reminding us what Jesus said. He's whispering over us. That's why it's so important to be still. Because Holy Spirit's not, Hey, ready to rumble! Like, that's not Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit's whispering in the stillness. And if you'll quiet yourself enough, you'll hear him. If you'll be still enough, and give him margin, oh, he'll work in it. He'll move you. He'll use it. So we have to pray, Lord, open our eyes. The number one, we look for your goodness and we see your blessing. And number two, we start speaking words of faith over every part of our life. And then we start speaking life over our present. That's how we not only frame our past, because how many know God's going to use it? God's going to use your past. Whatever frame you've put on it in the past, he's going to redeem it. He might even give you a gold frame for it. But it's your job just to stand here now, be still, open your eyes to see, my God is my refuge, my strength, my present help in times of troubles. He is my everything. And his his living water is flowing into my life to give me new life. I want to pray over you today because I believe God wants to redeem your story. And however you came in, you can meet God today. You can meet him and let him reframe your past and let him show you, hey, every ounce of that story, how many use it. I'm going to use it for my kingdom. I'm going to use it to bring people to know Jesus. I'm going to use it to heal somebody or just to encourage somebody to get help. So as we pray today, I put these frames up to give a, a, a picture. <laughs> no pun intended. But to give a, a symbolic to where we can come to the altar with our frames. I think it's so important that when we come to the Lord, we don't leave anything behind, but we bring to him our past, we bring to him the parts of us that we are not proud of, we bring him to parts of us that we don't want to show everybody else. Because what happens in his presence is he, he takes our past and he perfects it with his power and he uses us to walk forward, whole, healthy individuals.